Cool. Thank you uh, very much um, for your talks, Keith and Katharina. I think uh, what we have to say is probably in a way panning out a little bit, but I think what you've shown us a lot is about the how and kind of how platforms are constructed. One of the things that we want to talk about is what conditions need to exist for platforms to thrive. And those, those conditions are organizational as much as uh, specifically technical. Uh, but maybe we should start with a little bit of a history. Uh, do you want to move to the next slide? So, uh, so this is the uh, article that Eric referenced at the start in his introduction. This happened way back in 2014. Uh, I remember it. Uh, it was kind of one of the first internal conversations I really participated in as a thought worker. Because uh, at that stage, and maybe still today, you could argue, microservices had become very fashionable. And I say fashionable deliberately because I think in programming, we're still at a stage where programming is a pop culture. I think that was an, something Alan Kay said. So we have a combination of things that we do because they're good ideas, because there's reasoned argument, because there's empirical evidence, and also other things that we do because we see other people around us, uh, uh, around us doing the same thing. So what Martin did in response to a, an internal discussion was to write up an article about what you need to have in place for microservices to be a good idea. Because what we were seeing was some clients who would adopt microservices without, for example, being good enough at the observability and monitoring to know when there was a fault, without having the pipelines, for example, to make changes frequently. So they adopted something they could see the value of, but they hadn't really understood what it was they needed to do to make it work. Uh, and so this article inspired me and people still refer to it today. I think it's still probably pretty good advice, even though it's a short article. Um, but if we go into the present day, um, you just hit the next slide, Cristobal, uh, back in 2021, uh, we think that there's a similar thing you have to consider when building internal platforms. So just like back in the day, there's certain things you have to have in place as an organization to expect to succeed with a microservices architecture, uh, Cristobal and I have uh, a variety of opinions on what you need to get in place for the same thing to, uh, to work now, because it's not, it's not enough to see that an idea can be successful and therefore think that you will be successful if you adopt it. You have to, uh, in many cases, and platform especially is a maneuver where you need to get it right. You need to think about everything that needs to go into it to execute it really well. Um, if you just move the next one, Cristobal. Um, so this is this is a slide that I actually uh, screenshotted from Keith's talk before because I thought it was uh, actually quite a good way of explaining this bit because uh, something we've realized is that the word platform is used and abused in all sorts of ways and can mean all sorts of things. So what do we mean when we say you have to be this high to build a platform? Well, you can see that uh, Keith's marked out that the cloud provider is going to provide the infrastructure at the lower level, probably. Like there's a certain amount of services that Azure or GCP or Alibaba or AliCloud or AWS provides. There's a certain bunch of stuff at the blue level that your teams want to do. And the thing is your teams have a job to produce products for your end customers of your business. So that's kind of what they want to be concentrating on as much as possible. That value add, that thinking of new features or new conveniences or new ways of presenting something that adds value to the final customer. And that layer in the middle of the green bit is something that can sometimes become a burden on teams when they want to be producing new blue stuff that's end customer value. So, uh, you know, things like delivery services and application runtimes might involve some heavy lifting that it doesn't really make sense for everyone in your organization to do. Or if you think back to all the things Katharina was talking about with security services in an organization, do you really want every uh, team in your organization, I don't know, to start with, separately having an internet gateway, which I'm told is a no-no, that was something Katharina was uh, hunting down and destroying, or do you want them even to have to go through the effort of evaluating and providing all these different like tools and configurations or choosing? Even if they do make their own choice and every, and every team happens to have a security expert on it, do you really want everyone making a slightly different choice as to what kind of scanning tools to use? So there are certain kinds of services that there is potential value to be derived from if they're done by someone inside the organization and provided to other people inside the organization. And if it goes well, the value is that the people working in the blue areas can focus on what their actual job is more and focus on other stuff that gets in the way, stuff to do with infrastructure less. 
Um, one final bit before we get into what we think organizations have to do. Uh, Cristobal and I take a broad view of what constitutes a platform. So, you know, obviously people talk about Kubernetes and runtime stuff a lot. Uh, because the job is to reduce the burden on the blue people, we take a platform to mean anything that does that. So it could be documentation, it could be tooling, it could be runtime support, um, but it's about what it's for, which is reducing the cognitive load on the people providing the blue stuff that makes it a platform in the sense that Cristobal and I are gonna mean going forward. Cool, so shall we move on to the, the first attribute, Cristobal? Cool. Um, so why, why an organization would consider to build a, a platform, right? This green, um, green layer between the blue and, and the cloud. Well, basically it's, it's, it's an economic decision, right? As, as many other in companies and organizations, we, we don't need to lie ourselves. And, and basically what, what we need to balance is that, um, this developer productivity platform is going to either or maybe both. It's going to either reduce our costs, it's going to make us more cost effective when, when bringing features to our customers, or it's going to, to improve our time to market. It's going to get us faster feedback too, right? And as an organization, we need, or, or the organizations facing these questions need to think if the benefits they are expecting in either one of these forms are going to be bigger than the potential costs incur that we are going to incur on, or they are going to incur on when um, not only designing and building and running the platform, but also the opportunity cost, right? Um, this, uh, this, uh, these capabilities uh, need to be built by people with talent and talent is not something that is, uh, it's, it's, it's really scarce these days, right? So is the best use of, of our local talent or internal talent uh, or, or the talent we want to source um, to build a platform? That's, that's a very legitimate question. But you could say probably that it's a question that any mid-term, long-term is in investment is, 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 is going to face within any organization, right? Investments uh, need to have always this balance and, and they are done, hopefully, um, addressing these questions. The thing is that platforms and technical platforms in particular uh, are very special and then the decision need to be, decisions to, be, to, 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 to build one of them need to be carefully balanced. Why? Not only because the opportunity costs, but because uh, a technical platform, depending on your ambitions, might not bring in value from day one, right? Um, as I said, or as we discussed before, and you can imagine from the talks Steve and Katarina were, were discussing or were showing to us, um, they need to be designed, they need to be run, and the adoption is not going to be made, depending on what the state of your code, depending on of, of your products, adding those new tools, it's not going to be free or immediate at all, right? And this is going to, to take some time. While you are adopting your own internal platform for, for which you are paying, uh, other people around you or, or other people around organizations that are applying to that platform are going to be the same. And I'm going to learn from the same uh, knowledge available for everybody, right? And they are going to uh, maybe be successful, so successful that maybe they are going to create or, or companies are going to be created offering the same thing you are building in terms, right? And this in the technological world happens quite quickly. So uh, we need to maintain this balance, right? To maintain this balance because this mixture of technical complexity, opportunity costs, adoption, potentially slow adoption, and the risks you are incurring by ingraining this platform into your into all your uh, development processes uh, could make um, your backlog also look uh, more or, or, or be, be very biased towards continuous improvement instead of a constant flow of new features. If we want to use an analogy, um, a development platform could be more something more related to the power grid than the latest local or the, the latest um, social network, right? It's more stable, more dependable, more uh, something that you can build on top of than something that's shiny features every day and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, is it only business value that matters? Well, it matters, but there is many things that increase they're going to discuss about. Sure thing. So uh, once you've uh, satisfied yourself that you've got a good business motivation for building something and that it's actually gonna be good for your organization, you also need to think about executing on that vision effectively. So the purpose of you having this platform is to make life easier and to take a load off 
people who are building developer, uh, building products directly for your company. Um, so you are building products to design to delight your customers, right? And you do have customers. You don't have necessarily paying customers because those pay customers are colleagues, but you do have customers and your success needs to be evaluated relative to how much you actually make their lives easier, how much you make it possible for them to do their jobs more effectively. Um, it can be an advantage, right? So with internal products, you have users that are highly invested in your product's evolution and success, right? You have people who are really motivated to want to see you to do a good job as a platform provider. You'll have people who give you feedback. You know who your users are. So, you know, if you want to understand whether what you're doing is going well or not, you can buy your colleague coffee and ask them how well it's helping them build uh, the, their microservices or things like that. You have a access that someone who's building a product that is direct to market could only dream of. Um, and you really need to not abuse that trust. So I'd say maintaining goodwill is, is key to adoption. So probably you'll have things that'll go wrong. You, Like any cloud vendor, you'll have things that are outright outages or mistakes. You'll have some things that maybe weren't as useful as you first thought. Your colleagues are probably quite willing to be positive and constructive and give you feedback and support as you change, but you have to pay attention to them. And I guess one of the big things that I would say about uh, building internal uh, developer productivity platform is you really shouldn't be using it as a coercive measure. So if you have a situation where you think, well, my customers are inside the building, I know who their boss is, and I can ask their boss to force them to adopt things. It's a really dangerous crutch to lean on because if you do, then you're taking away the feedback loop for your platform organization that makes you wanna keep delighting them and keep genuinely making their lives better and their jobs easier. Um, so yeah, uh, I would recommend taking inspiration from the literature on making delightful technical products that exist out there. I've got Marty Kagan's book reference there, but you should be thinking of your internal consumers of your platform as customers of a kind, and you should be placing your uh, aims and getting your satisfaction from their successes. Should we move on to the next one, Christopher? Cool. Okay, so um, we're in a position now that we have decided to build a technical platform and we now, we have valuable uh, feedback loops and we are going to ask our colleagues internally to build it. So from that point, from that moment on, the team in search has become an internal service provider. Uh, and that means that they are needing to manage the service they are providing to the rest of the company, right? And when we talk about and when we speak about service management, I probably some of you um, start to think about very boring uh, or very, very regimented documents um, or frameworks that have been around for a number of years. And, and you are probably true at the end of the day, not a not everything that we do in technology is, is super fun. Fortunately, um, this, I would say, seasoned approaches of to service management that, that your internal teams are going to, to need to take um, have been, like, I would say, superseded, or we can say superseded by an approach that is quite recent. And it's uh, the approach that was, I think it was published initially by, by people at Google. I, there has been many versions that there were some other words uh, or some other use cases of the world before that. But I would say like in the last 10, 15 years, the, the term site reliability engineering or systems reliability engineer has been, engineering has been uh, quite popular. And we, so my experience or experience, the approach to service management that site reliability engineering is, is probably the best, um, the best approach that a platform, a team in charge of a platform should use, right? Um, what does it mean, this? What does mean that a team should excel or should be good at a platform team, a team in charge of a technical platform should be excelling at site reliability engineering. Well, this has, has many tenets, has many aspects. Uh, you can imagine more, most of them, but it's, it, I think it's good that we, we can, we just enumerate some of them because it's not only about technology. Technology is super important, right? Because these technical, these technical platforms are sometimes complex. In any case, we want many people to use them. So we need to understand Things like, uh, in some cases, like the ones Keith mentioned, right? We need 
maybe or, or team need to have a good understanding of networking, maybe operating systems, container, security, as Katharina was mentioning as well, um, storage, container orchestrators, and this kind of stuff, they will need a, a good knowledge, a good knowledge, operational knowledge, but also fundamental stuff, fundamental stuff like, yeah, sorry, I'm sorry, but queuing theory, it could be, depending on your load, could be really interesting, or theory in distributed systems like cap theory and all the associated stuff you can think about and we, we don't need to dig further into this is the kind of things the technology the technical bits that you need that this this these folks need to manage when building a linear platform but it's not by no means the only thing operational um operational excellence for a platform team means that they are managing the service from the point the, the point it's design and this means they are understanding not only the customer needs, but also the risks they are uh, creating for those customers and how to communicate them. So they need to convey the message in which risk, so in what risk are you, are you incurring by using my platform? And this is the famous SLO topic. So they probably need to be good at creating, building, showing SLOs to, the, to their colleagues, SLOs or, an, or equivalent um, mechanisms. Um, Beyond the design, they need to understand how to do big changes in the platform, for instance, how to make it live, how to make it uh, to the commission it without uh, having a without generating a, a big issue within the company. Not also, not also big changes, also small changes, right? How we do new small improvement, how we change a version of something uh, in agreement with the SLOs to provide it, right? We measure them, we check them. Um, Capacity. It's maybe one of the, the the things we only forget when we are in a hurry, right? Um, we, we forget when we are in a hurry, and, and then it it's, gets gets a big issue. Are we ensure we are managing our demand? Uh, are we aware of what the demand is going to be? Have we have an idea how we are going to react to this demand? Are we going to provision more hardware? Are we going to have the budget to do it? That and so on and so forth. But this is other stuff that platform teams might need to do. And last but not least, I I, I know that you probably were expecting that. Uh, incident management. What happens when the, the platform is not delivering the service they need to deliver? Right? How do we ensure that incidents are well communicated? Everybody is aware of what's going on. The service is returned as fast as possible, but this is not the only goal of service management. That the underlying causes be, uh, that are sustaining the incident are properly analyzed and addressed in the midterm. Right? All these things are 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 basically the the aspects of a service management. A book of practice, if we want, or, or core of knowledge, or 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 um, or, or uh, topic, and uh, they are things that your uh, the team in charge of a platform needs to manage, right? From the technology part, from the, to the process part, and uh, of course, it's not only about technology, um, so or it's not only about operations, but also about this. Um, yeah, so here's here's the the next slide in the key. Uh, so uh, obviously you've heard from Katharina and Keith a lot more than we're going to go into now about how to actually effectively construct infrastructure assets that form part of your platform. Um, but the point we wanted to stress was that a platform organization isn't just a rebranded operations department, right? So you need the operational skills that Cristobal emphasized. You need to know what this stuff is made of, what a network is you know, what block storage is, how to use the cloud provider APIs, but you also need to have the software engineering skills to build something that's sustainable and evolvable. So in Keep's book um, that I guess a lucky few customers will win, um, he defines uh, infrastructure as code as being about defining everything as code, continuously testing and delivering work in progress and building small, simple pieces you can change independently. So the reason that's important is that if you don't have those disciplines in place, then you're gonna have problems with evolvability. And the killer part of evolvability problems is you may not really understand the depth to which you have them until you've already got other people defending on your platform. So if you have purely operational capabilities, let's say uh, you're able to set up a wonderful production environment that serves everyone needs in a point in time, but you haven't been able to build that using uh, the kind of uh, decoupled designs that Keith talks about without having the pipelines and testing to make it possible to get to the next step, then what you're going to find is you've got a lot of people depending on you. They're depending on you to adapt and change and improve, but you really don't have the ability to do that safely. 
So it's not just about operational mastery. You really need to have a software engineering skills in order to, to make a platform successful over time. Uh, and you know, you're probably going to find that your internal product teams who are consumers of this platform find that there's a little bit of demands placed on this as well because they're consuming something built by their colleagues that might not be quite as well known or polished as something that's available in the industry. And we're counting on those product development teams to be good and engaged customers of the platform as well. So this is the penultimate point, and we have uh, one more of the five points in our model of what you need to have in place. Cristobal. Sure. Um, so besides all the technical and technological parts, there is something which we find very important, right? And, and if we get back a few years and we have a look at the writings and the, the, well, the writings from one of the more prominent thinkers about, well, or authors or system thinking, which who was a uh, Russell Agos, right? So he said something like, we find it very true. We find it very every day. A system is never the sum of its part. It's the product of their interaction, right? How does this apply to a team? Well, a team in particular, any uh, complex product team, but in particular platform team, it's way having skilled people, have, have experience, having experienced people in the team, it's important, but it's nowhere as important as having a healthy culture within the team, right? A healthy team, and you, you could say, you could, you could ask me, and, and how do you, how do you, how do you, how does a healthy culture look like? Well, in platform teams that come from, and, and, not, and some of them comes from, from a more operational background, there is something that um, uh, sometimes we see, and it's this uh, existence of the, the individual silos of knowledge. We have like two, three very skilled engineers that they know a lot about uh, one specific problem and everybody looks at them. Well, we consider that an anti-pattern. We think that healthy teams uh, consider that the artifacts, the code, and the services they own are collectively owned. So they are something from, so that some, something that the team as a whole manage, and they, intentionally not only so they they, they reach this, st this status but also intentionally work to keep that status with practices like the retrospectives we all know or pair programming or other practices the team might deem uh, interesting they ensure that all of them as a team can own a service right and they do not um, rely on specific individuals that know much more about this product or other product and so on it's only about this. No, they, they only they, they also need to 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 have a, a very good prior, uh, workload management. Uh, they, they need to have very good workload management mechanism. They need to understand why their work brings value and then manage this workload that it's not bringing actual value, but they need to do it because uh, because it's needed. Like um, toil work, uh, maybe. Mm, ticket handling and so on that can be automated and they need to make uh, themselves uh, some space to reducing toil work in, an, in in a continuous basis, right? So they need to be very focused on, on continuous improvement, having a look at their backlog, ensuring that there is every time more time for doing value work and less to, to do value uh, and, and less to, to and less time needed to undertake, uh, undertake, undertake toil work, right? Um, at the end of the day, what is going to happen is that these kind of teams should be very focused on value work. And whenever the, the, um, the product is quite mature, the stream of, of, of um, or the features or, or the product works in a very optimized way, we might find difficult to justify more uh, value work into the, into the stream. And we could think we can add more products to this. So we can make this, this team to be in charge of more products, right? This whole thing, we are going to add a new one and so on. Can we, can we do this? Of course we can. But we would say we need to be very careful of the cognitive load. Cognitive load, so the ability for a team to understand the products they are working on or the platforms they are working on, it's super important. At the moment that a team does not understand what they are doing, the operational quality of the service is going to decrease and your costs, as we have seen, are going to be impacted. So the reasons for keeping that, that platform alive are might be going not, not going to be so compelling as it, as it were initially. So. As, as people in, in, in complex products, we know that the bottleneck of a knowledge work team is the brains from the people that are on it. So we need to be very careful and take care of this as, as the bottleneck that it is. And now the next slide. 
difficult. So you might say that what we've said is quite ambitious, right? So we said you have to know about making like the business justification for what you're doing, understand platform as a product, have operational excellence, software engineering excellence, and have awesome healthy teams to make it work. So, you know, at the start, Eric said, well, you know, if you don't have those things, then does it end in tears? And uh, we thought about this very hard because we didn't want a council of despair. You don't have those things, you've no business, go home. Well, actually, we think there's a very good route to getting to the point where you can doing something useful, but it's to constrain uh, the, uh, your, the scope of your ambition, not compromise on the quality of your execution. So don't build a really big platform that you can't live up to, that has problems and that you can't evolve into a really good one. Start by targeting the really important needs of your developers that uh, in your product development teams are struggling because they're distracted. Find out what they are and start by doing really targeted, high quality things there. It's true, you still need business justification, product thinking, operational software excellence and teams to execute it. But if you're able to start with a small, tightly scoped thing to do, then you'll find it much more achievable to, uh, to grow as an organization and to, to master those skills without creating things that become dependencies of your whole organization that might, uh, that might have quality problems. And again, if you make adoption voluntary, you've got a self uh, built in safety and design pressure that helps ensure that you do actually keep yourself honest and genuinely create value rather than just creating software artifacts. So that's, that's our answer to avoiding the tears that, that Eric uh, teased us with at the start. So maybe we could just mention one more opinionated thing that I think comes up quite a bit uh, when we're talking about platforms on the next slide, Cristobal. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, we are, um, Thoughtworks is is really involved in software development, right? And as a software company, there is there is um, we are using software development practices, and sometimes they are not very close to the operational practice. Some some platform teams come come from, but um, extreme programming XP is one of the um, framework. Well, well, at least in, in experience, one of the um, sets of values, practices, and principles that we can find around that has been very, very useful for us, and we can find that we can find that can be transplanted into platform teams very, very easily. Why? Because platform platform um, products, as any other products, are complex, so they benefit from this uh, proof, sense, and respond approach. Like we test things, we see how they work, and then we move forward to the next problem. And in this kind of product work or this kind of knowledge work. Basically, what we try to do is to organize or work in, in longer uh, cycles in which global objectives are defined or general ob objectives are defined, which in XP are called the quarter cycle, but we can call them as we want. Um, then we do a small steps towards those, um, towards those cycles, maybe weekly. And this is what um, XP calls the weekly cycle. And we acknowledge that uncertainty is going to be there. So we don't plan the weekly cycles to be fully packed with work. We, from day one, know that there is going to be some slack time to, to deal with this uncertainty. The teams are, or the work along this, uh, within these uh, weekly cycles is organized, within the cycles is organized in, in backlog items that sometimes they're called stories. There are other names for that, it's not really important. And the team is working on them, owning them by sitting together. That means in, in, in the current scenario probably it's not really possible, but um, maybe having a high, a high bandwidth, low latency communication medium uh, among them or between them, um, and in, a, in an environment in which energized work is possible, right? So they are understanding their backlog, they are seeing their backlog, they are seeing other information coming from their products, and, 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 and they own all that stuff, right? And also on the more technical side, um, we cannot agree more with, with what Kip said. Right? Or, uh, there are many practices that are super interesting and, and for platform teams as well, like incremental design and test first. It, I, I would say we can agree, of course, they are not always easy. Uh, in, in building a, a platform or build, building infrastructure test first is not always easy. But what one can be done when the team has, finds a way to do it, it brings many benefits. It exerts the kind of design pressure that allows your, your product to be changed quickly, and it's going to be changed. That, that's for sure. Your product is going to change. So let's, um, if you can change it quickly, it's going to be better. 
The same goes for continuous integration and 10 minute field, right? This kind of system, this kind of practices generate or create the kind of environment in which uh, changes can happen safely and fast. That's something that we um, apply or try to apply in conventional products for our teams, our, our teams apply to it, and also when building a more technically oriented uh, products like this. And now, I guess we could probably just say, you know, don't lower your standards when building platforms. It turns out that a lot of the lessons we've learned in other areas of software engineering apply. And just because you're building a platform doesn't give you kind of an excuse or a reason to, to forget about other things. Absolutely. Cool. So just, just to, to, to wrap up, um, I will be wanted to end on a positive note as well to celebrate the successes of platform engineers around. So, you know, if you are a product developer in an organization with some really awesome platform teams, then, you know, you can see further, you can achieve more. You're liberated from some of the details that otherwise would be slowing you down. So I thought of that quote by Sir Isaac Newton, or actually, um, uh, I think it's Bernard of Clairvaux, but it's like uh, in English speaking world, Isaac Newton. Um, if I've seen further than others, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. So there's both a difficulty and a, you know, a challenge to being, building a platform because other people are depending on you, but it genuinely does when it pays off, uh, you know, provide other people with a chance to achieve more than they otherwise would. So it's something that we, we should celebrate. Um, so that, this is the, the final slide, except we have another final slide. Do you want to just go uh, two forward just for the, the other thing we wanted to put in as the epilogue, uh, Cristobal? So thank you. And one more, one more maybe. Uh, so the other thing just to say is that Cristobal and I have also written very similar content to what we've done today in an article that's up on uh, Martin Fowler's site uh, today. So uh, if you're the sort of person who prefers to read an article rather than watch a talk, well, I probably should have given you this link at the start, like uh, half an hour ago, but sorry about that. If you want to revise it as an article, uh, here it is. And it has the five points that we talk about in the talk, if you're, uh, if you're curious to uh, follow up about that. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Cristobal, for pairing with me on this talk.